If there's three things I could always rely on in this world, it'd be the bass from Rio, creatine, and the joy of another Forgotten Philosopher video, and guys, this one is a banger. Because many of you might consider yourself skeptics or critical thinkers, people who are able to doubt everyone and everything. Well, our philosopher today, Josiah Royce, is going to challenge you by bringing back an idealist philosophy. Royce was born in California, but not influencer, three grand a month for rent California. Now, this was the Wild West California in 1855. His parents came over in search of gold, and while I couldn't find out if they struck it rich, I'm sure we could make some safe assumptions. He eventually started studying at UC Berkeley, then was able to travel to Germany to study philosophy, and finally to Johns Hopkins, where he met a certain figure. He's my favorite philosopher. He has a unique beard. That's right. He met William James. Now, an idealist like Royce had some serious differences with a pragmatist like James. But despite this intellectual rivalry, they were really good friends. James even later helped him get a job at Harvard. Here's a picture I found of both of them, and while I am a simp for James, that pant leg length is horrendous. But yeah, he taught at Harvard until he eventually died in 1916. So not a super crazy life, as he was mostly in academia. Now as for his philosophy, this is really where the unique fun comes in. Again, Royce is an idealist, and he's going to attempt to set up an absolute idealist god. We're going to be taking a look at his first major work, The Religious Aspects of Philosophy, to see just how he creates this unique god. Firstly, Royce knows what he's facing. Alright, he knows about you skeptics out there. So he meets you on your own playing field. He's like, alright skeptics, you doubt things. But what does it mean to doubt things? It means that something might be in error. But that begs the question, what then is error? Royce takes up the whole chapter really diving into the nature of what error is. And out of it will emerge a god, but just wait, just wait. So what is error? Well, things in themselves can't be in error, like a bench just randomly sitting there. But a judgment can be an error. But judgments must be made about specific things, specific intended objects. For example, if I were to say, this pad thai is spicy, I'm making a judgment about an intended object, that being the pad thai. So for error, we need a judgment and an intended object of that judgment. An error occurs when the judgment and the object disagree with one another. So then judgments err only by disagreeing with their intended objects. And they can intend an object only in so far forth as this object is known to the thought that makes the judgment. Alright then, problem solved, right? Well, there's just one problem. This guy Kant came along and distinguished between phenomena, how we mentally perceive something, and the thing in themselves, the actual object in question. For example, if I look at a pencil, I'm perceiving the pencil from a specific angle, in a specific light, during a specific time, with my specific biases. I'm perceiving the pencil, yes, but it goes through all these mental filters that I'm not really able to view the pencil in itself. The objective pencil, one might say. But instead, I'm viewing and thinking of my own biased look at that pencil. So how does this cause a problem? Well, Royce has a pretty handy example for us. Imagine two people, John and Thomas. Let's say John makes a judgment about Thomas, saying that he's 5 foot 10, for instance. In actuality, Thomas is 6 foot. Is John in error then? As of now, no. John's intended object of his judgment is not the actual real Thomas, the Thomas that's six foot. He's making a judgment about the phenomena of Thomas to him, a Thomas he believes and sees as being five foot ten. Put another way, John has an idea of who Thomas is in his mind, a phantom Thomas, so to speak. John is not making a judgment about real Thomas, but is making a judgment about Phantom Thomas. But since Phantom Thomas is however the heck John perceives him to be, then it's impossible for John to err, because he'd be judging his own mental creation. In short, on this or our original supposition, John and Thomas are independent entities, each of which cannot possibly enter into real person into the thoughts of the other. Each may be somehow represented in the other's thoughts by a phantom, and only this phantom can be in intended by the other when he judges about the first. I know that's a lot, so there's no harm in rewatching that explanation. Trust me, I read like a snail over this part. Remember that picture of that dress that everyone was arguing was either gold or blue? In this case, the actual objective reality doesn't matter. We were making judgments about how we personally perceive that dress to be. We were judging the phantom phenomenon dress in our mind. Therefore, no one could be wrong because our intended objects were of our own creation, essentially. Maybe that's a better example. The point is, 
we're screwed. Under this framework, it seems like no one can ever be in error because we're all just judging our own mental images and living in our own worlds. And yet we know in our hearts, in common sense, that error must be real. It must be a thing. Twist as one will, one gets not out of the whirlpool of thought. Error must be real. And yet, as common sense arranges these judgments and their relations to one another, error cannot be real. There is so far no escape. But there is an escape listed on the next page, so we just kind of lied. Let's go back to John and Thomas. What if there was a third party? A third party that knows the real objective Thomas and John. The people in themselves, I guess you would say. Okay, so this third party would know the real truth of things. But on top of that, this third party would need to judge the judgments of others. So they would be able to know not only all the physical things in the world, but all the thoughts and internal things. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the absolute knower. You and I and all of us, all good, all evil, all truth, all falsehood, all things actual and possible, exist as they exist and are known for what they are, in and to the absolute thought. So this is the god of Josiah Royce. Sometimes he's called the all-including thought, or the infinite thinker, or the absolute knower. Essentially though, this is a thinking god, and within his thought, singular, all and everything that has and will exist is within it. All truth, all error, all people, places, and things. It reminds me of the all-encompassing nature of the Tao and Taoism, but here, we exist within a thought. Why this emphasis on thought and thinking? Because only judgments or thoughts can be true or false. So if I pointed at a bird and said, that's a seagull, I'm making a judgment about an intended object. But this absolute knower is able to know not only the actual thing in itself of the bird to determine it's in fact a pigeon, but he's also able to look into my brain and see my judgment. Then he's able to declare that my judgment is objectively false. I know, it's a bit confusing and I still have a bunch of questions, but Roy sees this as absolutely necessary or else we just fall into relativism. He must be there this judge, to constitute the error. Without him, nothing but total subjectivity would be possible, and thought would then become a purely pathological phenomenon. Our thought needs the infinite thought in order that it may get, through this infinite judge, the privilege of being so much as even error. Now, I don't know about you, but I still have a lot of questions. What exactly is the nature of this absolute knower? Are we able to find out through him what is error or truth, or are we just stuck? Well, this video is really intended to be just an introduction to Royce. Because again, this is his first book, and from what I understand, all his subsequent books build off of this. So for those of you who plan to journey further into Royce to find answers to these questions, just remember the main takeaway from this first book. What then is an error? An error, we reply, is an incomplete thought that to a higher thought, which includes it, and its intended object is known as having failed in the purpose that it more or less clearly had, and that is fully realized in this higher thought. Now, Royce is often called an idealist, but also a pragmatist. But that sounds kind of oxymoronic, right? He's clearly an idealist, but why is he considered a pragmatist? Well, it might be because he considers the practical effect of ideas. And thankfully, there are some within this first book. The one I want to focus on quickly is that the infinite knower knows our thoughts, yes. But that also means he knows our desires, our pains, our wishes, our struggles. We often may feel lonely and isolated, like no one else knows how we're truly feeling. But belief in the absolute knower is belief that there is someone out there who truly knows you. Thou all-knowing one seest us, what we are, and how we strive. Thou knowest our frame, and rememberest that we are dust. In thy perfection is our ideal. That thou art is enough for our moral comfort. Now, practical considerations really take off in his later work, apparently, but I'm just one guy with limited time, so there you have it. The life and introduction to the philosophy of Josiah Royce. Recap time, what do you guys think? For me, I always love creative philosophies, and this is certainly one. Not sure I agree, but I appreciate the creativity. Let me know your own thoughts down below, and be sure to subscribe, like, and hit that bell. And share this video with that person you match with on Tinder, so you can come off as sophisticated and into the finer things in life, like philosophy. But with that, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.